for this month. I would like to say all of you tuning in, welcome to the Tennessee Native Plant Society's uh, Native Plant Seminar Series. And tonight our speaker is Tony Lance, with who's going to be speaking about Certify Your Yard. He's with the um, Tennessee Wildlife Federation, and yes. he's the he's a naturalist with the he has been a naturalist for the Nashville Park System. He's a longtime birder and beekeeper, and he's a most at home, being outdoors, hiking, and backpacking. Sounds like a lot of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. He's even done something that our our, our Marchie Hunter hasn't finished yet. He's, he's uh, done the complete through hike of the Appalachian Trail. Mm. Um, the Tennessee Wildlife Federation is one of the largest and oldest Nonprofits dedicated to conserving the state's wildlife and natural resources. Uh, they're partnered with the National Wildlife Federation to help Tennessee create wildlife sanctuaries in our yards, large and small ones. 90% of Tennessee's land is privately owned, which means providing for our state's diverse wildlife is largely up to us as individuals. By doing our part, we keep Tennessee the most biologically diverse inland state in the country. Uh, Tony is the Federation's in-house certified wildlife habitat expert. So without further ado, I'm going to say welcome, Tony. Thank you so much. And at this point, I'm going to start some screen sharing. Okay. Lovely bluebird. Yeah. Actually, it's not bluebird. Actually, okay, there we go. Ah, with a fish. <laughs> All righty. So, um, Thanks for the introduction, but I'm going to go ahead and go through another introduction myself. My name is Tony Lance, and as um, Karen said, I work with the Tennessee Wildlife Federation, and this evening I'm going to be talking to you about the uh, National Wildlife Federation's Garden for Wildlife program and how you can create a wildlife habitat garden to support birds, butterflies, bees, and other creatures. I'll also tell you how you can have your gardens recognized as certified wildlife habitats by National Wildlife Federation. And I'm also going to warn you ahead of time, I'm a shameless bird nerd, and as I go through this presentation, there are going to be several times that I'm going to go on a bit of a tangent and throw in some interesting facts about a few of our fine feathered friends. So when it comes to that, please indulge me. <laughs> and before we talk about wildlife habitat gardening, I want to tell you a little bit about the National Wildlife Federation. NWF was founded in 1936 and is one of the oldest and largest wildlife conservation organizations in the United States. It's really not a stretch to say that it's America's conservation organization. Its mission is to unite all Americans to ensure that wildlife thrives in a rapidly changing world. Uh, it does work in a wide variety of ways, from working to protect large areas of habitat that benefit many species to species-specific campaigns. NWF has offices throughout the United States and has separate uh, state affiliates in each state who band together to fight for wildlife. Uh, NWF works in Washington at the federal level to ensure we have strong legislation to protect wildlife and its habitat. It also publishes Ranger Rick magazines and has a long history of inspiring kids to go get outside and develop a love for the natural world. And it has many programs that people can get involved with right where we live. And we're going to be talking about one of those this evening. So not all wildlife uh, is, is large, furry, or feathered, uh, you know, or only lives in wilderness areas. Insects, for example, are wildlife. So are songbirds. Many wildlife species can happily coexist right alongside people within our cities, towns, neighborhoods, and even our backyards and gardens if we just provide them with quality habitat. So 
Since 1973, and yes, that's 50 years this year, the National Wildlife Federation has been inspiring people to do just that, to restore habitat and invite wildlife that has been banished by concrete, pavement, and lawns back into our neighborhoods through its Garden for Wildlife program. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir here because I could tell in the conversation that you were having um, as before we started this, that you guys really know your botany. But let's cover a little bit about this program. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Put simply, wildlife relies on plants for survival. In nature, plants provide habitat for wildlife. They form the very basis of the food web. Without healthy, diverse plant communities, wildlife cannot survive. That's true in wilderness areas, but it's also true in our cities, towns, neighborhoods, and even our own yards. Whether we live in downtown or in the suburbs or in the country, plants are the bottom of the food web. Insects are the next level. Insects are important wildlife in and of themselves, but they're also food for many other species. Plants support insects. In fact, the majority of insects rely on plants that share their evolutionary history the native plants of the region. And that's really the definition of native plants. They're simply the plant species that evolved in any given region. And again, preaching to the choir here, but native plants are great choices for your garden or landscape because they evolved in your region. They thrive in the local climate, weather patterns, rainfall levels, soil moisture with little need for extra watering or pesticides or fertilizers. But most importantly, native plants are the plants that wildlife rely on for survival. Let me give you an example here. Native oaks serve as the caterpillar host for 557 species of butterflies and moths. That's 557, think about that. Compare that to non-native but commonly planted ginkgo, which supports a whopping zero species of butterflies and moths. And as you very well know, this is true of most non-native plants. So here's what it boils down to. Wildlife need plants to survive. Specifically, they need plants that are native to their region, the plants that they co-evolved with. And that's what the National Wildlife Federation's Garden for Wildlife program is all about, encouraging people to plant native plants that provide habitat for local wildlife. The act of planting something for a purpose is the very definition of gardening. When you plant vegetables, you're a vegetable gardener. When you plant native plants to support wildlife, you're a wildlife habitat gardener. Okay, let's talk about what we mean by wildlife in the context of the wildlife habitat garden. Songbirds, butterflies, and hummingbirds are the kinds of wildlife that will be attracted to a garden or landscape planted with natives. This is great because everyone loves birds and butterflies. But there's a world of wildlife beyond birds and butterflies that will also benefit from your wildlife habitat garden. The world of insects is incredibly diverse beyond just butterflies, like this beautiful damselfly. Remember, insects are wildlife, and amphibians like this tree frog are on the decline worldwide, but your yard can help support their local populations. And sometimes wildlife that scares us will also show up in the wildlife habitat garden, and that's okay. Animals such as snakes are incredibly important wildlife, and most species are 100% harmless to people like this garter snake. All snake species help keep rodents, insects, and either, even other snakes in check. Wasps can sting, yes, but they are also pollinators like their bee cousins. 
Unlike bees, wasps were also predatory, tirelessly patrolling the garden, taking care of actual pests. These kinds of wildlife should be welcome. And sometimes some wild animals can be a nuisance. You don't have to welcome every creature and you can focus on birds and butterflies and put up fencing or repellents to, to deter other wildlife such as deer. Um, just remember, in most cases, conflicts with wildlife like raccoons are usually solved with a few simple behavior changes on our part, like storing pet food indoors, waiting until the morning to put trash out, and using trash cans with tight-fitting lids. And when you create a wildlife habitat garden, predators will also show up. And that's a good thing. It means you're doing it right and you've created a food web. And we're not talking about mountain lions and bears here, but animals like foxes, hawks, things like that. Um, one of the little sides I wanted to point out is the bird you see on the left there, um, that's a greater roadrunner. And that's kind of an iconic southwestern species. But over the last 50 years, it's expanded its range. And it's practically now in Tennessee. It's covering right now the whole state of Arkansas and has moved into Missouri. And uh, it may be in Tennessee within our lifetime, probably owing to climate change. I mean, just like the armadillo, just like the um, uh, 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 scissor tail flycatcher, coyote, things like that. It is on the move. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the next couple of decades we have roadrunners here in Tennessee. And remember, the, uh, the wildlife habitat garden isn't just for wildlife, it's for people too. Um, we all know the importance of getting our daily dose of nature and there's no better place to do it than right outside your back door. And that doesn't matter how young or old you are, it's really, it's really important to our physical health, our mental health, our emotional health to get out and enjoy the natural world. Okay, let's talk about what makes a wildlife habitat. All wildlife species need four things to survive. Food, water, cover, and places to raise their young. We're gonna talk about each of these specifically. And when you provide these four things and commit to maintaining your yard or garden in environmentally friendly ways, The National Wildlife Federation will recognize it as a certified wildlife habitat via our Garden for Wildlife program, and I'll tell you more about that at the end. So let's start with the first component of habitat, food. The first thing you probably think about when someone says feeding the birds is putting up bird feeders. I get that. Um, there's nothing wrong with it, but remember, birds only use feeders as a supplement to the natural foods they find in the landscape, and only a few species of birds will even use a feeder. So think of feeders more as a snack, not habitat. The best way to feed birds and other wildlife is by planting native plants. Native plants provide food in a lot of different ways. They produce berries and fruit. They produce cones, seeds, and nuts, and all sorts of birds and other wildlife rely on these food sources. Plants also produce nectar, which is the primary food source for butterflies and bees. Hummingbirds and moths also rely on nectar from flowers as their primary food source. And plants provide food in other ways too. Sap is a food for sap suckers, a kind of woodpecker. Pollen is an important food source for bees and other insects. Bees feed the young pollen and without it, they cannot survive. Some animals will eat the foliage of your plants and that's okay. This crazy looking caterpillar you see there on the right is uh, feeding on the leaves of its host plant, passion vine, which I think is the uh, state wildflower of Tennessee, if I'm correct. And that's going to turn into a gorgeous uh, gulf, gulf fiddleary butterfly. I happen to have some of these in my garden this year. Oh. 
So as mentioned before, uh, native plants are the foundation of the food chain, followed by insects. The importance of insects as a food source uh, can't really be overstated. Everything eats insects, including other insects, spiders, small mammals, frogs, lizards, and birds. In fact, uh, insects are an especially important, important food source for birds. 96% of our backyard birds rely on insects as a primary food source for themselves and to feed their young. Without them, you can't support birds. And so remember that when you're tempted to reach for insecticide. So let me give you an example. A recent study looked at Carolina chickadees and found that one pair of chickadee parents have to catch between 6,000 and 9,000 insects just to successfully raise one nest of babies. And they only hunt for those insects within a radius of about 150 feet of the nest. So that's an incredible amount of insects. But if you plant native plants in your garden, you'll support them and in turn give birds the food source they need to survive. And this is really wildlife conservation on the scale of your yard. After insects, other small animals are the next level on the food chain. Again, this is normal and natural. Predators are important and everything needs to eat. Once you've planted native plants and created a food web, you can supplement with few feeders. There are many kinds of feeders, from seed feeders, to nectar feeders, to suet feeders. Just be sure to regularly clean your feeders. Uh, dirty feeders can spread disease. If predatory hawks show up at your feeders, remember when you put out a seed feeder for birds that eat seed, you're also putting out a bird feeder for birds that eat birds. Cooper's hawks, which is the one shown here, and their smaller cousin, sharp shinned hawks, feed on smaller birds. It's normal and natural. And if this bothers you, you might want to take down your feeders, which attract small birds. Now, this is an example of what we're not talking about when we say provide food for wildlife. Uh, we're talking about providing natural food sources by planting native plants and creating the food web. Unlike birds, which don't become dependent on feeders, mammals do and start associating food people with food. This is unhealthy for them and can create dangerous situations and typically ends fatally for the animal, either from malnutrition or by animal control. So don't do this. This is not something we have to think about too much in Tennessee, although we do get bears, I guess, in the Cumberland Plateau and farther east. But uh, yeah, this is not what we're talking about either. Squirrels are the other exception, mostly because there's not much you can do uh, to keep them out of your feeders. The best way to, to deter squirrels is to get a squirrel-proof feeder and see what happens. Squirrels seem to have an uncanny ability to outwit us when it comes to getting into our bird feeders. Okay, we've talked about food, and let's talk about the second component of habitat, and that's water. All wildlife needs water for drinking, and in the case of birds, for bathing to keep their feathers in good condition. Some kinds of wildlife actually live in the water, like this green frog. Water makes up their primary habitat. And you might be one of those lucky people who have a large pond on your property. This kind of water feature might attract waterfowl, wading birds, or aquatic uh, turtles. Um, if you do have that, be sure to leave a buffer of natural vegetation as habitat and to absorb runoff to try not to mow all the way down to the water's, water's edge. And more likely, you only have room for a small garden pond like this one. That's totally fine. While well, this kind of water feature won't support waterfowl or aquatic turtles, but lots of wildlife uh, from birds to frogs to dragonflies will use it. As with larger ponds, 
make sure to have plenty of aquatic vegetation to provide habitat and to serve as ladders in and out of the water. Aquatic plants also compete with algae and keep her, a smaller water garden from turning into pea soup. If you don't have room for a pond, that's okay. A simple bird bath will meet the habitat requirement. Uh, any shallow dish uh, will work. Just make sure the water depth is between one and three inches, at least. And if you... Moving water is also attractive to birds. If you can add a small fountain or a mister to your pond or bird bath, Herman birds will go crazy over that. Um, there's some uh, solar powered uh, fountains on the market now that I've tried to use, and they work very nicely. My hummingbirds seem to enjoy those a great deal. <laughs> and you never know what kind of birds are going to show up in your bird bath. These are barred owls. And just because we call them bird baths, that doesn't mean only birds will use them. Tree frogs, like the spring peeper and gray tree frog, will use bird baths to keep their skin moist. And insects need water too. Um, you might want to put some stones, like you see on the right, to uh, serve as landing places so the insects don't fall in and drown. And even mud puddles can count as a water source. Uh, birds are happy uh, to drink and bathe in puddles and butterflies engage in a behavior called puddling where they drink the mineral rich water from muddy soil. Of course, one concern with having a water feature is mosquitoes and controlling mosquitoes is pretty easy. It takes mosquitoes about five to seven days to go through their aquatic larval phase. So all you have to do is just dump out bird baths every couple of days, and you'll also dump out any mosquito eggs and larva. If you have ponds, you can inoculate uh, the water with natural bacteria that targets mosquitoes, but is harmless to other wildlife and people. Uh, I think this bacteria is sold as mosquito dunks or mosquito granules and can be found at hardware stores and uh, online and Amazon. So now we've covered food and water. Let's talk about the third component, which is uh, uh, cover. So wildlife need places to hide from predators, or if they are predators, they need places to hide from prey so they can get a meal. Uh, as these photos demonstrate, plants are the main way that wildlife will find cover. The same plants that provide food will do double duty and offer cover too. Wildlife also needs cover from the elements. Animals will seek shelter during times of extreme heat or cold, during rain or snowstorms, and during times of high wind. Uh, again, plants are where they go to find this cover. Evergreens like cedars, spruces provide cover year round and are particularly important in winter months when deciduous trees and shrubs are leafless. Plants with thorns, like this one, offer a bit of added protection for small wildlife like the sparrow. And this is another little tangent I'm going to indulge myself on. This particular sparrow may look fairly nondescript. It's a white-throated sparrow. And uh, it's a winter resident in Tennessee. It breeds in the far north up in the boreal forests of Canada, but comes here in the wintertime. And you wouldn't think to look at it that it's anything special, but it's arguably one of the most remarkable birds in the world. And I say this because it's been found it's the only animal known to have four sexes. Um, because of a, a, a strange genome inversion, this bird has two color morphs. It has the tan individuals, the tan crown and the white crown. And the males of the tan will only male, mate with the females of the white crown. And the females of the tan will only mate uh, with the males. I think I said that the wrong way. The, 
the tan males only mate with the white crown females and the white crown males only mate with the um, tan crown fe uh, females. <clears throat> so effectively, functionally, these birds have four sexes. And that's something that was only discovered really within the last couple of decades. And there's no other example of that known in the world. So providing cover with plants is largely about how you plant your garden or your yard. Uh, if you plant densely, like in this photo, you'll provide plenty of cover. Planting densely doesn't mean that your yard needs to look messy or overly wild. Uh, if you plant in large patches, native, native species, and practice good garden design, your natural wildlife habitat can be as beautiful as this one. Cover is important because many species will just never visit an open yard, and that's mostly like mostly a lawn. Uh, species like this wood thrush need the cover of trees and shrubs and forage for food in the branches and the leaf litter. And they're rapidly declining in part because we've converted their habitat into lawns. <laughs> and even fallen leaves provide important cover for wildlife. Many species live in the leaf litter, so try not to rake, rake up or blow away every leaf in the fall. Instead, use it as a natural mulch in your garden beds as nature intended, and that'll provide cover for lots of small animals. Uh, in fact, many butterflies and moths will overwinter in the fallen leaf litter. You can even build a brush pile by stacking logs and branches into a pile that becomes sort of a, like a wildlife hotel of sorts. And I know that's not for everybody. It wouldn't work on every property. But if you live in an area where you have enough space for it, it is a great wildlife attractant. I, I do have one in my own yard. And it, it really works well. <laughs> And even dead plants are full of life. Uh, fallen logs and branches provide cover for many animals like this red eft, which is the juvenile phase of the red spotted newt. Uh, small animals can hide under logs and if they're hollow, inside them. And if you want, I, 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 you can have fun and provide cover by putting out what's called a toad abode that will offer shelter to toads and other small animals. Insect hotels are also another trend that seems to be catching on. And one thing that I've been tempted to try, in fact, I've been shopping around recently for them, are these roosting boxes. Um, a lot of times in the winter, bluebirds and other species will cluster for warmth inside cavities. And uh, uh, these roosting boxes are a good way uh, to do that effectively. They have the little perches inside, so they don't they don't have to sit all on top of one another. So we've now talked about the uh, first three habitat components: that's food, water, and cover. Now let's talk about places to raise young. And this one's really important because it's great to feed a bird. It's great to provide places for small animals to find cover or something to drink. But unless species have the space and resources to find a mate, engage in courtship, build a nest, lay eggs, dig a burrow, give birth, and successfully raise their young, their, the species are still gonna decline. So your wildlife habitat garden can ensure the future for local wildlife. And again, plants are the main way you'll provide places to raise young. Most birds nest within trees and shrubs. Some birds build their nests in branches, while others nest inside cavities within the trunks of trees. Plants also provide natural hiding spaces where mothers leave their young. Deer fawns and baby rabbits spend most of their day hiding in the vegetation while their mothers feed nearby to avoid attracting predators. Even species that don't directly care for the young, like turtles, need vegetation to hide in as babies to avoid predators. And 
And some cavity nesting birds will use a nest box, which mimics the natural tree cavities they normally nest in. You know, wrens, chickadees, bluebirds, tree swallows, woodpeckers, and even some species of warblers, uh, owls and ducks, like these wood ducks on the right, will use nest boxes. And here's another little interesting aside I'm gonna throw in here. The birds you see on the left might look to you like the common Carolina wren that we have all oh, across yeah. the state, but that's actually a Buick wren. And uh, Buick wrens used to be really common and widespread in Eastern North America. And they're still pretty common out West, but over the last 50 years, their numbers have plummeted. And the last known nesting Buick wrens in the East that I'm aware of were actually in the Murfreesboro area about 10 years ago. Um, the last sighting in Tennessee was in 2017. And the last sighting that I was able to find um, east of the Mississippi was in 2020 uh, near Bowling Green. But these birds have pretty much disappeared. And it's thought largely it's due to competition with house wrens. House wren populations have increased dramatically while Buick's wrens have dropped, and it's a uh, thought that the house wrens have just outcompeted them. And bluebirds are kind of a conservation su success story. Uh, nest boxes, nest boxes have actually helped bluebird populations recover after their population crashed in the first half of the twentieth century. It's not just birds that need nesting places. Bees need places to nest too. We have more than 4,000 species of native bees in North America, not including the non-native honeybee, which is really a domesticated species brought here. Um, and unlike honeybees, most native bees don't form hives. They, they're solitary, they nest in the ground or in tunnels, and or occasionally decaying wood or plant stems. So if you can leave some bare ground in your garden for ground nesting bees and rotting logs, that'll really help these species. You can also help nesting bees by, this, this is a little um, uh, bee box. These, these straws, these uh, stems, uh, the bees will actually tunnel into those and, and nest. And many native bees need mud to build the chamber walls of their nesting tunnels. And birds like robins and phoebes also can use the mud to build their nests. So a bowl of mud can be an important resource to allow wildlife to raise their young. Bat houses provide cover for bats, but often they're used by female bats as a place to give birth. A good bat house is large, at least 24 inches high and about 18 inches wide with multiple chambers inside. Um, don't place a bat house on a, on a tree. Instead, put it on a pole with some sort of predator guard or mount it on the side of a building at least 12 feet off the ground. And some species need completely different resources during their juvenile phase of life. The caterpillars, uh, butterflies, and moths feed on the leaves of plants instead of flower nectar like the adults. They can only eat the plants, eat the leaves of certain plants called host plants. Without those host plants, these insects cannot reproduce successfully. Similarly, frog, toad, and many salamanders start out life as aquatic larvae that breathe through gills. So they need a clean supply of standing water, preferably without fish, to successfully complete their life cycle. So now let's focus for a minute on one particular butterfly species, the monarch. I'm sure everybody on here knows what a monarch looks like. It's large, beautiful, black and orange, and unlike most insects, they're migratory. The population east of the Rockies all migrate to a few spots in Mexico for the winter. In spring, they repopulate the continent over the course of four or five generations relying on milkweed to lay their eggs. West of the Rockies, the population migrates to coastal California. And unfortunately, both pop populations have plummeted, largely due to the loss of habitat and specifically the caterpillar host plant milkweed.
You see, monarch caterpillars can only feed on milkweed. It's a species only caterpillar host plant, and without it, they can't reproduce. And milkweed has a bit of a PR problem. It's got weed in the name, making it seem undesirable. Uh, but the good news is there are several dozen species of milkweed native to the U.S., and many of them are absolutely beautiful garden plants. Mm -hmm. And these are just a few of them. Clockwise from the left, up to the top left, you'll see antelope horns milkweed and white milkweed and showy milkweed, swamp milkweed, butterfly weed, and then common milkweed. And by planting milkweed, we provide places to raise young for monarchs and help their populations recover. So that covers the four components of habitat, food, water, cover, and places to raise young. So once you provide those in your yard or garden, it's important to maintain it sustainably using uh, environmental, environmentally friendly ways. For example, don't spray toxic pesticides or use polluting chemical fertilizers. Using organic gardening techniques, conserve water, don't plant invasive non-native species, and plant native instead. Here are a few ways to conserve water. You can reduce the size of your lawn, plant natives, use rain barrels, and create rain gardens. I know this is a bit controversial. I've had some very heated discussions about this, but if you can, keep your cats indoors. Um, Free-ranging cats kill billions of songbirds and other wildlife each year. Don't you pet use pesticides. Pesticides kill plants and insects. Instead, go organic. And you can try natural pest control using uh, things like these parasitic wasp. And also pay attention to your windows. Over a billion birds are killed annually by window strikes. So place your bird feeders away from the windows, try to reduce window reflections. And if you can, turn off lights during migration. And also try to address light pollution by turning off lights at night, reducing your landscape lighting, use down-facing bulbs, and use yellow bulbs. And where possible, use sustainable products using recycled materials. And try to use green maintenance, reducing the size of your lawn, using a push mower, and electric equipment. And a favorite of mine is to leave your leaves. I try to keep them out of the landfill, leave them whole, compost or shred them, uh, because they do comprise important habitat. So this is a standard landscape for most of America, and really it supports next to nothing. It's just a dead zone. And this is what wildlife is up against. So it's up to us to make the choice to plant with a purpose and create wildlife habitat gardens and landscapes that actually fit into the local ecosystem and support wildlife. You don't have to rip out your entire yard or let your entire property go completely wild. Small changes uh, can make a difference if they're done at scale. So what if we went from that to this? This landscape is beautiful, it's natural, it's not overly wild. There's still some lawn, you know, maintained naturally. And uh, this, this kind of yard can support dozens of species of birds, butterflies, and other wildlife. If each of us added one new garden bed filled with native plants each year, uh, the impact would be huge. And think about starting small and kind of going from there.
that you can create a wildlife habitat garden pretty much anywhere, not just in a yard. You can create one in containers on the city rooftop or a balcony at your office, at the local school or library or at your church. If you can plant something, you can provide habitat for wildlife. So when you certify with the National Wildlife uh, Federation, you become a member, you get one uh, free one year subscription to National Wildlife Magazine, a lifetime subscription to the Garden for Wildlife e-newsletter, a per personalized certificate, a 10% discount to National Wildlife Catalog, which offers feeders, bird baths, nesting boxes, bed and bee houses, and more to enhance your habitat garden. You'll also have the exclusive right to purchase and post the certified wildlife habitat sign to share your accomplishment with your neighborhood and help spread the wildlife gardening message. The $20 application fee and sign fees go to support the wildlife conservation programs of the National Wildlife Federation. As I mentioned earlier, this is the 50th anniversary of the program, and we're right on the edge of getting to 300,000 certified wildlife habitats. So to find out a little bit more about this program, you can go to nwf.org forward slash garden. And uh, while there, you can apply to have your yard or your garden certified by the National Wildlife Federation. Or you can go to gardenforwildlife.com. The website's mobile friendly, and if you're on social media, we're on both Facebook and Twitter. And you can follow us and join the online community of wildlife gardeners across the country. And uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for listening. Uh, any questions? Wow. Thank you. <laughs> that was a, a nice overview of really why many of us garden. Um, a lot of us are wildlife gardeners. Um, we have some questions, I think, in chat. Let me start. Let me take a look. Uh, one is a, wow, congratulations on completing the AT. That is quite an accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> well, and thank you. That was a long time, a lifetime ago. Oh, one question. Do shade plants provide habitat, food, shelter, etc.? My garden gets very yep. little sun. Sure. I mean, when you think about it, uh, in a natural setting, there are plenty yeah. of plant species that uh, are shade tolerant and that are suitable for wildlife. Um, I'm sure if you were to go to any Native plant uh, purveyor, you'd find all kinds of uh, I agree. Shade tolerant species. Uh, someone. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Sure. Hi. Um, my husband and I live on uh, a little bit over uh, two acres uh, in Gallatin, Sumner County. Mm -hmm. And um, it's impossible to create, you know, plant all of that in natives. Um, I'm making headway. I have large garden areas, um, and I've made mistakes along the way in the five in, along the way in the five years that we've lived here. But um, and planting more and more natives, and and we also have about I would say about a third of our property is heavily wooded. Um, lots of oak trees, uh, shag bark, hickory, and uh, cedar, and numerous other uh native trees um we have bat uh bats we have owls we have um just a tremendous amount of wildlife my question is this i can't always maintain it i'm currently recovering from shoulder replacement surgery so it gets pretty weedy you know those some of those non-native weeds get in there and make me crazy and i can't always get to them right away um how big of an impact how much of a negative impact, I, I should say, are those weeds? I know some of them are actually natives, but how 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 ne much of a negative impact is that on wildlife when you have a garden that gets just kind of consumed by weeds among the natives, if that makes sense? 
Yeah, I mean, how do you really answer that? How do you measure that? I mean, let's face it. Um, there's so many exotic and non-native plants out there. We're never going to rid ourselves of them. So I think the proper tact is really just to try to encourage as many natives as, as you can uh, mm -hmm. while culling what you can. But it, it's, it really is like the proverbial finger in, in, in the dam kind of thing. Um, so I, I don't know how to answer that really properly. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, all right. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, well, then my sec the second part of my question is, is there a minimum uh, garden size or anything like that? No, no. Well, that's good to know. Thanks. No, no, no minimum size at all. I mean, let me share my personal experience. I have it's a sizable yard. It's about two acres. And about seven years ago, I took about a third of an acre and started planting natives. I put out a wildflower mix, some native grasses, um, and just kind of let it go. And a lot of saplings came up. So I've got a, a lot of trees, a lot of um, uh, smaller smaller things, flowers, goldenrod, uh, coreopsis, things like that. And I was telling Karen earlier while we were kind of waiting for everything to start that um, I tallied up earlier this year, um, I had 19 species of birds nesting in my yard, a third of an acre. And um, let's see. I wrote those down, but I don't have it handy right now. But I had things like blue grosbeaks, which normally need large mm -hmm. expanses. Fortunately, I do have some neighbors with good habitat, um, so they take advantage of that. But even in my little third of an acre, I have prairie warblers, um, you know, common yellowthroat, uh, chipping sparrows, indigo buntings, uh, towhees. Um, and with my nest boxes, I've got bluebirds and I've got tree swallows. So you can do a lot in a small space, especially if you maintain it over time. That, that doesn't mean do it every day, but just when he says over time, it's it's the the more natives you have, the better. One thing I'm kind of curious about, because you guys are <laughs> probably way more informed of native plants than I am. And I'm starting to get into native grasses. And I, I'm going to try to um, include those in my landscaping. And does anyone here have experience with that? You know, how, how do you get it to take? For example, I tried it a couple of years ago and they didn't really take off. Um, so I'm just curious if I can tap into your knowledge on those. Any takers? Ah, that sounds more like a with the native grasses, you're thinking prairie like. I am. I am. <clears throat> yeah. You have to keep the trees out to mow it once True. a year. True. <laughs> this is Karen in Gallatin again, and my limited experience with native grasses. I bought um got seed for big blue stem, little blue stem, and Indian grass. Mm -hmm. And um winter sowed them and planted them in a very small garden area in full sun. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really separated away from the native, you know, the flowering plants, but um, it's taken some time, but they have taken. Um, and I mean, they're not very big here at the end of the summer because I really only got them in the ground in May or June, but I, I mean, they've taken and I anticipate they'll be back again next summer so if i'd like to hear from others too but I, but to your question i winter sowed the seeds and they did fine well i do have an interest in that um and one of the birds that i've attracted which totally surprised me is i've gotten bob white quail and uh which Ooh. is just i i do live in robertson county and there's still a fair amount of farmland but i every year for the last five years i've had a couple of bob white quail which Come through my yard, the male singing. I don't know that they've nested there, but I do see them. And I know that native grasses are particularly appealing to them. So I'd like to make my yard as uh, desirable to the bobwhite quail as I can. Probably someone at Quail Unlimited could mm. give you even better advice on that one. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. We have some um, questions in chat. <clears throat> Are cultivars such as black hawk antrobagon native enough to be helpful? 
Um, well, you're going to have to tell me what that one is. I'm not familiar with the, the Latin name. Mm -hmm. What's the common name for this? Bettina, what are we talking about here? Yeah. It's uh, it's big blue stem. A big blue oh, stem. Big blue stem. Okay. It's a dark purple, almost black, big blue stem. It's a really beautiful grass. It looks just like big blue stem, only it's dark. Yeah. Well, big blue stem, Indian grass, switchgrass, those bunch grasses are desirable for a lot of wildlife. Um, again, bobwhite quail love them and uh, a lot of other bird species some of the smaller some of the uh, the sparrows really do like these bunch grasses um, i'm sure it's great for for rabbits um, not that i need a lot more rabbits in my yard right now but uh, yeah i would imagine that uh, any cultivar big blue stem would be fine thank you sure um how difficult are pawpaw trees to grow well, I, I I can't speak very very authoritatively to that. I mean, I know I see them a lot on the uh, banks of the creeks around where I live, and if I'm lucky, I'll find a pawpaw that I can eat every now and then. But uh, yeah, I don't. I'll have to defer on that one. I can personally say that once they get started, you will have plenty. <laughs> do they handle full sun? Yes, they do. Okay. Yes, I have. I believe I have five now. Okay. Uh, I planted two, lost them in the meadow, planted two more, and now we found we have a wild one just inside the woods. Uh, I would think they're clonal, so I would think they would need a lot of space to expand into. Yeah. I, I have uh, 10 on my property, all of which I've planted, and um, I, I, I moved in here about 11 years ago, and that was one of the first trees I planted in the woods. And um, in all that time, none of them have taken off. I have not had fruit. I've got one that I got at a nursery that was somewhat larger, and it did produce flowers, but then they just fade and drop off, and I've not seen pawpaws. However, the one thing that I've noticed they're doing uh, uh, one tree has produced two other uh, shoots nearby. And that's why they call it, I think, a pawpaw patch because they will send out rhizomes. And um, mm -hmm. I plant them mostly for the um, zebra swallowtail. That's mm -hmm. their host uh, plant. Oh, yeah. And I actually saw a zebra swallowtail this year. I, I've seen in living in Tennessee for 20 years, I've I've only seen them once or twice in the, the state butterfly, but mm -hmm. I did see one this year. So maybe somebody's finding my pawpaw trees. Yeah. Go find a Creek and, um, you know, um, encourage your dog to pee on the, uh, on the stones on the Creek. That'll almost certainly attract a zebra swallowtail. <laughs> oh. <laughs> now are all the pawpaws you're getting, um, um, the same sex, because I think they're, they're dioecious. Yeah. Right. And, and so what I've done, I've bought all those, those got trees, boys and bought girls. them over time from different places. So I have no idea, but. Um, yeah. that's... Four of mine are from different places. And the fifth one is a volunteer hmm. that's bigger than any of the others that I put, I planted. So it was obviously here sooner and that had flowers this year, but we never did see fruit. So. Might need a girlfriend. Hmm. Or boyfriend. <laughs> or a witch. <laughs> yeah, or a boyfriend. <laughs> you guys bring to mind a, a question that I have for you. Uh, my sassafras trees are all dying. Oh. Hmm. And I understand there's a disease that's killing sassafras trees. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one, during one of our um, presentations, I, I believe... Oh, one of the presenters mentioned that, and she noted that um, uh, sassafras trees are related to um, spice bush, mm -hmm. and that there is something out there. I don't recall whether it was uh, a fungus or a mite or an insect or something, but there. She did mention that that they sassafras trees could be under threat from some. Um, 
some new uh, pathogen. Uh, yeah, that's that's the the bay laurel wilt, which is a fungus that's carried by a beetle. The fungus and beetle both came from Asia. They're wiping mm. out uh, the bays that are used for bay leaves in cooking as well, uh, both in the U.S. and Europe. Um, in the U.S., it's really doing a number on the uh, the bay laurels along the Georgia and Florida and South Carolina coast. And then um, moving with people, maybe people moving firewood, it's, it's not really sure. Um, it's leapfrogging to population areas. So when they first spotted it in Georgia, they thought it was going to take 50 or 100 years for it to reach Atlanta. It's now in Atlanta and Chattanooga and Nashville and uh, skipping over a lot of the rural areas in between those cities. And it does attack and kill sassafras trees. Well, it, it got mine last summer. I had, had several that were sizable and had a nice form and they just wilted within a week. Hmm. That's sad. Why have the sassafras not really bloomed for years? Um, I don't really know. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, Nick Douglas also has a comment, uh, maybe a question, I'm sh not sure. He says, for grasses, grassland that mix native grasses with flowering forbs, check out Southeastern Grasslands Institute and Quail Unlimited. Also cruise around the big WMA near Crossville, which has a thinned woodland with grassy understory as an oak savanna restoration. Mm -hmm. TWRA plus the two organizations mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Also don't overlook some of the important self-seeding annual grasses like prairie drop seed, which is important in the Middle Tennessee Barrens, Glades, and Penny Royal Karst Plain. So some good advice there. Does anyone else have a question? No, I have not heard any comments on lichens, mosses, and fungi, especially uh, tree fungi. So that's a very interesting thing to uh, uh, study. I'm wondering what eats those. Pardon? I wonder what eats them. Oh. What mm -hmm. wildlife eats fun eats mushrooms? Well, well the box turtles eat mushrooms. Slugs and so they eat uh, fungi. Okay. Okay. I'm told turtles and chipmunks eat fungi, mm -hmm. and I think they're insects that eat lichen off of uh, trees and shrub branches and maybe rocks, too. Mm. Well, I know that, uh, well, I don't know what eats them, but I know that I joined National Wildlife Federation back in my college days. As I was coming out of college, that was the first organization that I joined. And uh, it, it's been amazing watching the organization grow. It's hard to believe it's been around so long. Um, and once I moved into this house I'm in now, we we went ahead and certified, and we have a certification nice plaque out in the, near the gardens. And we've improved our yard just one garden at a time each year, a new garden or expand one of the others, mm -hmm. making it a little bit bigger. So I still haunt the plant sales spring and fall 
find out something new because something didn't work out. So I've got a place I can put it <laughs> or I can expand a place, expand a place and put it in there. So it's, it's been a fun journey. And I can recommend that if you don't think you have a lot of wildlife, put out a wildlife trail camera. <laughs> you will be flat out amazed. <laughs> Absolutely amazed. <laughs> we just found out today that our bobcats have been in the front yard. Wow. Just in the backyard. We have a dead, found a dead rabbit. So we must have interrupted them <laughs> at some point. And uh, but a dead rabbit in the front flower bed, right against the house. Mm. Where you I know, know they feed and hide. <laughs> yeah, you know the office that I work at for the Tennessee Wildlife Federation is just off Charlotte and White Bridge, uh, West Nashville. Uh, but mm -hmm. we have Rich and Richland Creek right behind our building, and we've had deer, turkey, river otters, and mink mm. all right here at our building, just in the in the creek behind us. Oh my. Yeah, Mink is mention, fabulous. Yeah, not to mention the great blue heron and the kingfisher that hangs around. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's, there's plenty of stuff right here that use the stream as a corridor. Yes. And that's probably one reason we have so much wildlife, too, is that behind our yard and mm -hmm. meadow, there is a, down the hill is a stream. And that's a corridor that goes underneath 840, a major highway which we're, we butt almost up against. But with that stream corridor that goes under 840 into farmland, it's a funnel for a lot of wildlife. So it, it's, I know it was our sanity during the COVID period when we were restricted and where we could go and what we could do because of our ages and the disease. So my husband and I just thoroughly enjoyed watching all the goings and comings throughout the our little tiny yard, but it's it's amazing what we have. Um, I highly highly recommend it, even if you've got just a balcony that you can put a pot on. Do yeah. it. <laughs> it's a start, and you'd be surprised. You know, you you'll get pollinators. You'll get caterpillars and the things that feed on caterpillars are birds so you you've got a nice start right there just a pot of native plants so um i have one question about my uh is the T tnps publishing a new reference on glade plants um not exactly one of our members is working on one. I'm not sure yet how it will be published. She's not that far along. Okay, so stay tuned, maybe. That's a very positive, maybe. Okay. Um, any other final questions before we say good night? Okay, I wanna say thank you very much, Tony. Thank I enjoyed you. this thoroughly. And uh, awesome. We appreciate your coming. Thank you for and having we'll me. We'll be in touch. All righty. Good, uh, good night, everyone.